In the last class, we ended chapter eight on new perspectives with an idea about racialization. And in this class, I claim that this was some of Mises' best work. The idea that race is a product of racism, which is different from those ideas that uh, racism arises from some sort of fact or idea of biological race. He also explained what a racist logic is. It's an essentialist representation of a group. The idea that a group is completely homogeneous, that it never changes, and that everyone in the group shares a certain set of characteristics which are difficult to change. It works from the dominant onto the subordinate and is done when we are trying to construct or defend unequal experiences a set of ideological beliefs. It's also historical and it comes out in attitudes and actions so that we can see racism as both interpersonal and institutional and we don't want to lose sight of either of those things. In the first part of this conclusion chapter, uh, Mies revisits this somewhat before he gets into his eight themes, which is mostly what I want to talk about today, but I want to talk a little bit about uh, how he revisits this. On page 125, he does say that, again, he, he kind of reiterates that understanding the processes of racialization from the perspective of lived experiences allows one to complexly understand both how race is deployed at the level of everyday practices and how discrimination is deployed at the interpersonal level as well as how everyday lives are structured by the institutionalization of racialized thoughts and actions to construct a system of racial oppression. Which again is pretty good, a little bit wordy there, uh, but uh, it helps us to understand race, I think, in a thoughtful and new way. Um, Mize here also mentions though, that what he wants to have happen or that what he wants to do is to, uh, bring in a perspective where sort of from the, from the bottom, you might say, or from the people who are experiencing racism, that they would be able to talk about it in a language that is anti-racist yet non-racialized. And he introduces us here to the work of Stuart Hall, who, uh, as he put it, is a, a cultural studies icon. Uh, passed away in 2014, I believe, but uh, was a Jamaican-born uh, uh, British uh, cultural studies person, really important or famous in this field. And uh, I couldn't get a copy of the book that, uh, uh, an image of the book that, that Mize is citing from, but this is another book by Stuart Hall, The Fateful Triangle, Race, Ethnicity, and Nation. And so Hall was reflecting on some of these terms and what Hall says in this block quote on page 124, if the black subject and black experience are not stabilized by nature or by some other essential guarantee. So what Hall is saying there is again, it is not, it is not sort of given in nature. It is not a biological reality. Then it must be the case that they are constructed historically culturally, politically. And the concept which refers to that, to this is ethnicity. The term ethnicity acknowledges the place of history, language, and culture in the construction of subjectivity and identity. And then Mies goes on to say that the improvement I find in Hall's discussion is the adoption of a new anti-racist yet non-racialized language to capture the politics of self clarification. And so in some ways, Mize, I believe, is endorsing this idea that ethnicity might get us uh, into a place recognizing that uh, Latinos, Latinos are often racialized, but that ethnicity might help us to uh, form an anti-racist politics. And I guess I just want to say here that I am not sure that this works in the United States. Um, this is something that uh, Stuart Hall was thinking about uh, from a British perspective. Hey, somebody's here. Hey, hello. No, not a problem. 
So uh, actually, you can just leave that door open now. I was uh, I had it closed because I didn't know if anybody was coming. Uh, so what Stuart Hall is saying is that ethnicity is our way of perhaps uh, getting past some of the ideas or or thinking about race as an, in an anti-racist way and being able to understand what that's all about. And from my perspective, I think that in the United States, I am not sure that this is going to work or I'm not sure it gets us any further than the idea of race. Uh, Stuart Hall was Jamaican born and lived most of his life uh, and taught from uh, the British experience. Um, and I think in some ways in the United States, as I've just been teaching in my cultural anthropology class, the terminology of ethnicity is, uh, is, has basically been substituted as a substitute for the terminology of race. And so when people talk about ethnicity in the United States, they don't necessarily acknowledge the history, language, and culture. Uh, that is not something that happens. Basically, we interchange ethnic terms with racial terms. And so it doesn't actually, uh, in some ways, help us beyond these dilemmas. I think in the United States, it's probably best to simply keep remembering how people are racialized and how that works as a, an ideological process, a historical process, and an interpersonal process as well. Um, and until we get a different kind of language to talk about it, uh, anthropology already tried once with ethnicity, I would say, and it didn't work so well. So that's a brief introduction. Then he talks about the future trends, the eight trends that are going to shape uh, shape Latina and Latino studies, the Latin American community in the United States, and indeed probably the whole United States. So he talks here first about demographic futures. Right, JJ? What does he say? Yeah. Super increase in population, so a huge growth. In fact, Latinos seem to be the only growth. Well, perhaps perhaps Asian Americans as well, but the, the large growth in the United States, if there's any population growth, uh, it's probably going to be from uh, the Latinos. In my class on, uh, when I teach Latin America these days, I teach that the United States is part of a wider trend. We're part of, and we, we talked about this at the very beginning of the course, that the United States is part of, it has always been part of the Americas. Uh, the fact that uh, the Latin experience is coming back to the United States is only a, a small part of history when we were first part of the, the, uh, the North American, South American, Caribbean experience from the beginning. And so when I teach about Latin America specifically, I also end up teaching a lot about the United States because we too are part of the Americas. And uh, I looked this up, this is an interesting uh, little statistic. The countries with the largest number of native Spanish speakers, Mexico, number one, and probably will be for a while. Then we have Colombia, Argentina, Spain, and then the United States, we're one, two, three, four, we're number five, just behind Spain. If you add in the number of people who are bilingual, uh, then we pop up to, the United States pops up to become the number two largest Spanish speaking country in the world. Probably won't catch Mexico for a while, but, uh, but quite, far up there in terms of the number of people. We are perhaps the second largest Latin American country at this point. Um, one note of caution here, as I talked about at the uh, back when we were talking about immigration, most people 
don't know Spanish by the third generation. So most of the time, the first generation does know Spanish if they're coming from Spanish speaking populations. Second generation is probably bilingual. Although like some of you in this class have experienced, you may know the, how to speak and understand, but might need to take some courses on how to write and do the spelling and grammar and stuff. And by the third generation, oftentimes there's not much left. Now, maybe that will change. Maybe the demographics of this will change in the next century, but so far it's holding. Second theme, new destinations, new places where people are, are going. And this includes a lot of uh, places in the South, places in the Midwest, and even places in upstate New York. As we saw in the film, one of the best films I think I showed in this class, Bienvenidos a Fleischmann's, uh, you know, Latinos coming into new places, transforming those places. In some ways, this was part of the whole point of the class was the new places that we find uh, being in upstate and around the state and other places, even Harvard College, uh, new places where people are coming in and transforming those places. Third theme, citizenship and undocumented immigration. As Mize points out, and this is true, there haven't been any updates to the citizenship laws in years, many, many years. Every so often we'll think that there's a possibility that somebody might pass a law that updates this. I don't think anything has happened legislatively for 25 years. There have of course been the, uh, the executive action on the what are called the dreamers or the uh, uh, people who arrive, uh, deferred action for uh, people who arrive uh, undocumented, um, which Obama signed into law. There was a lot of legal dispute about that. But the problem is nothing has been done legislatively. There have been no updates made from Congress. We're continually deadlocked about this. Now, again, another note of caution here. This, because this is still a trend, it doesn't mean the population of undocumented migrants has been increasing. In fact, it seems to have stabilized or gone down a little bit in the last 10 years. So this is not something that is, it's still a huge issue and resolving DACA, resolving the fate of the dreamers is still very much an important issue, but it's not an increasingly uh, an increasing number of the population. Health. Theme number four, issues of health. I think uh, Grace wrote about these on the, uh, the D2L discussion board, the what we call the Latino epidemi epidemiological paradox. And in some ways, because uh, Latin Americans come into the country uh, in order basically migrating in to be part of the workforce, their health outcomes at the beginning are actually better than, uh, than, most, uh, than most Americans and sometimes seem to be better uh, that the low income immigrants have better health outcomes than the, uh, the, the wealthier ones. And what uh, Maya says here is, is not a contradiction, but it means that as you become American, in quotes, it's in fact bad for one's health. So the more that people adopt the health habits of uh, U.S. people, uh, they tend to have a health decline here. So this is a, obviously going to be a huge issue, especially with the legislation around health pending. So uh, issue number four, 
health. Issue number five, housing. This is an interesting one. Um, Mize mentions the idea of hyper segregation, which can be in some ways a positive thing. The idea of being able to live in your own barrio or the book Barrio Dreams, Puerto Ricans, Latinos and the Neoliberal City by Arlene Davila, which Mize cites here. So it's an interesting uh, uh, phenomenon that you have immigrants coming in and transforming whole neighborhoods. What often happens though, this came up in the, uh, in that uh, the people who were talking from New Yorkans uh, that we, we heard, is the issue of gentrification of these neighborhoods. And what sometimes happens is that a mayor or a city will try and encourage immigrants to come into certain neighborhoods because they'll know they'll you know, fix them up and uh, have more people there uh, in places that have experienced an urban decline. But the problem is, is that in some ways then, those very places after they've been fixed up get, uh, get uh, people interested in those neighborhoods and will bid up the prices and result in this process of gentrification. So that some people have called this, or Galarsa has coined the term barrio side, which is you know the death of the barrio because you have this uh, people uh, moving in and, and jacking the prices up. As we probably all know, housing is hugely expensive all over the place right now. Um, and uh, this is especially true in places where uh, people might be trying to form new homes or get new places to live. So a fifth theme, housing. Sixth was economic factors. Um, interesting stuff here. I think that uh, one of the things that Mai says, which is that there's both exploitation and entrepreneurship. So on the one hand, a lot of people talk about uh, the economics of exploitation, of hiring undocumented workers, of hiring people at low wages, forms of exploitation. But we also see, uh, and we saw that a little bit in that uh, film, Bienvenidos a Fleischmann's, people starting to own their own businesses, going out and doing their own thing, transforming and becoming entrepreneurs in this market. So both of these things are at work in the uh, Latino community, and it's certainly going to be an issue. I found in this, uh, one of the people that my site uh, uh, wrote an article about examining if immigrant workers depress the wages of native workers. There's always been a, a claim that people make. Uh, from the economist point of view, uh, it seems that the effect is basically zero. There's not a depression of wages. And in the long term, it seems to actually boost the productivity and wages overall. But uh, that's hard to convince people of if they're convinced that it, that it does the other thing. Education. Aaron. How you doing? <laughs> you wrote a little bit about education. Why was this of interest to you? Yeah, this was a... I mean, so yeah, I mean, in terms of uh, uh, the, what happens when people get deported who have never even lived in Mexico, and then you have uh, monolingual English students trying to be enrolled into Mexico's public education system. Um, you know, it's, a, it's an issue. It has to do with, again, as we talked about the legislation around uh, that there has been no legislation about immigration. Uh, and as they mentioned here, uh, we often talk about uh, uh, President Trump as the person who deported a bunch of people, but really uh, in terms of the overall numbers, that was a policy that uh, Obama had 
uh, for a, a long time. Um, and so, uh, you know, a lot of people got placed on, or especially children, got sent to places that they had never lived in, creating problems in education. So that's one issue. And then, of course, the other issue we've talked about is uh, the idea of a leaky pipeline, the, uh, the quote, reality that Latino students have low high school completion, college attendance, and particularly low college graduation rates. So this is an issue for many people, um, is the ways in which, uh, for various reasons, people end up leaking out of the pipeline of education and not going on to graduate from college or get those PhDs and law degrees and medical doctor degrees. The last time we talked about this, I was very happy that somebody here wanted to be a lawyer. And that was the last time I've seen that person. So we're trying here, try to stay, stay in there. Finally, politics, political representation, which um, I think he may have discussed. Uh, one of the important parts of this is uh, the idea that uh, people that vote as Latino voters do not just care only about immigration issues. And so Mai says that they don't just care about immigration politics, but about issues such as the economy, education, and healthcare, which are exactly the issues that most people, uh, most all Americans uh, care about, basically uh, in that order. Sometimes healthcare comes up to the top, but people care about these things. And so Latino voters are not some unique segment of the population. As we've seen, they're part of the overall demographic and they are increasingly being the swing vote in many places. So we talked about the Virginia elections and how uh, the Latino vote probably was influential in swinging that and in a different direction. And uh, we repeatedly talked about how something Mize probably would have never predicted is uh, that in 2020, there was a pretty large swing, especially among uh, male Latino voters toward voting for Trump. Now, how can we explain that? Well, I think it's pretty easy. Uh, we've been talking about uh, how a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the Latino politics was based on uh, ethnic uh, masculinist nationalism in the old days, and that was a problem. But the other thing we've been talking about here is that it's not just an immigration issue, but people care about the economy, education, healthcare. And with the rise of uh, COVID-19, a lot of people thought that for, for better or worse, that uh, you know, there was going to be more emphasis on opening the economy uh, under Trump. So uh, this is a good sort of segue into the next part of the chapter. And so on Monday, we'll be finishing the book with the dangers ahead statement where we have, uh, you know, another, another eight things. They're not listed uh, as they were here before, but uh, listed out from nationalism through Trumpism. So we have eight trends, I think, that are pretty much right on. And then we have the dangers ahead section, which we'll read for Monday. Questions? Something from the chat, a sentiment that legal immigrants can often hold some resentment towards undocumented immigrants. Attracted to Trump almost as justification of their own hardships in immigration. Absolutely. And we talked about this in terms of how on, uh, when we're talking about uh, those 
uh, Mexican Americans on one side of the border and their stereotypes about Mexicans on the other side of the border, uh, these things can often be recreated among the youth and they can be in some ways used to uh, uh, within a community. So um, I think we should not, we sh definitely should not assume that people who are immigrants are going to be then pro more immigration policy. Um, that's been a, a dangerous assumption to make because it probably uh, works the other way just as much. All right.